I V M. I want to thank Intel for supporting our show. Do you remember last year when we spoke about how the Intel vPro platform is built for business? Well, I'm glad to say we've kicked it up a notch. That's right, Intel is back with a new and improved version of the platform. The new Intel vPro platform lets you do more of what you want and less of what you don't. So it's better for you and for your IT teams who really are the backbone of keeping your work from home experience easy and enjoyable. I can safely say that the new vPro platform gives you more enterprise efficiency with less constraints. Visit intel.in slash more with vPro, that's vPRO, to discover how you can get more done with less waiting. If you're listening on the IBM podcast Android app, click the link that's visible to you now. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Keval Ramani, and today I have with me two guests. We're going to be talking to me about China's engagement in the Indian subcontinent or South Asia, if you prefer. Um, I have with me from Brookings, uh, Constantino Xavier. Uh, Const- um, Constantino is sort of very, very well known uh, for his research and also uh, in terms of his appearances in media. He's done extensive research on India's engagement in South Asia, but also China's engagement in South Asia among many other things. Um, So he's going to be shedding light for us from a historical perspective, but also from the sort of current debates that are going on. And I have with me my former colleague and a member of the Takshashila family, uh, Shibani Mehta, uh, who's finally back on all things policy. And uh, Shibani and I have been working on a book chapter for some time on China's changing engagement in South Asia. Uh, And it'd be wonderful to hear her thoughts on how she thinks China has behaved during the pandemic uh, in the region. So folks, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's first begin with you, Constantino. I wanted to sort of get a sense of historically how China has looked at South Asia. Because when I sort of go back and I read a lot of the material that's been written since the 70s, 80s and 90s, there's a lot of talk about how South Asia has ranked extremely low in Chinese foreign policy priorities. Its priorities have been the sort of eastern seaboard, terrorism, with regard to Central Asia, and South Asia has ranked fairly low. Um, Yet, from an Indian perspective, when we look at it, we think of South Asia being dominant in Chinese thought. So I wanted to get your sense of how China's thinking over the years has evolved and how its engagement has evolved in South Asia. Uh, Yeah, thanks, Manoj. I think uh, to synthesize a a complex relationship, I would say that the Chinese interests in uh, South Asia are a function of the state of India-China relations. So if you look at uh, up to the 62 war, there was actually a lot of um, dialogue between India and China on these third countries. And in some cases, cooperation, coordination, uh, um, an interesting, you know, 1950s period where you had, for example, Prime Minister Nehru mediating a bit and facilitating even Chinese relations with Nepal. So that's the first phase. And of course, after the India-China relations uh, go downhill post-62 war, you've had the period of which we know most of until today, which is the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, um, you know, I'd say up to the early 90s, where you had often a hostile relationship playing out. And China, in many ways, like you say, disengaging from the subcontinent and keeping relationships really to a minimal, to some diplomatic representation, in some cases, some cultural diplomacy, a lot of convention centers, for example, in Nepal and Sri Lanka are subsidized by Chinese support. Occasionally, some tensions in terms of cultural diplomacy uh, with the Chinese trying to push these countries towards a more hostile relationship with India, but very punctual. And then the third phase, uh, you really see a more substantive relationship emerging between China and these neighboring countries from the 90s onwards, starting in the 80s, but 90s really significantly, uh, China becoming a significant supplier of military assistance to Bangladesh. Um, In Sri Lanka, from 2005 onwards, um, an economic presence that is significant in Sri Lanka. Um, Before that, in Myanmar, starting in the 1990s, 80s in some ways, a stronger presence there. So I'd say in this third phase, what you have is a lot of um, 
uh, economic investment from the Chinese, and therefore these countries playing a much more important role in China-South Asia policy. All right, that's a wonderful broad sweep of what the Chinese have done over time. Shibani, I wanted to get you in on this right now. Looking at sort of since the launch of BRI, so sort of 2013, 2014 onwards, there has obviously been a significant shift in terms of Chinese investments in the region. Um, But even sort of going before BRI, if you look at it from an Indian perspective, there was talk of, you know, a string of pearls. uh, And then as BRI has sort of evolved, you know, there's greater anxiety uh, given that India did not participate in BRI. And also, we've seen some conflict, uh, I mean, not conflict in terms of violent conflict, but at least some greater contestation for influence within the neighboring states between India and China. How have you sort of looked at this? Right. Um, there has been a contest in the subcontinent between India and China. And uh, that is most evident in how we sort of see this. the other states uh, respond to what... China is doing and what China is saying and um, also how it's reacting to India. And it's it's also evident in the smaller things, you know, like in your newsletter last week, you had mentioned that um, there were some uh, reports in uh, Indian media suggesting that this new, um, the new tariff uh, exemption that China had announced for Bangladesh was a charity that China was extending to Bangladesh, which uh, was not received very well and had to be withdrawn. And um, that just makes India look bad and also gives, you know, it, it makes China look good. So it's not necessarily um, the investments and uh, the BRI itself, but also the optics of the relationship that each of the states share with both India and China. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that uh, the particular uh, news report, I think it was Anand Bazar Patrika, which had that report, which spoke about that. It sort of created so much so that the Bangladeshi foreign minister actually responded saying, you know, like, what on earth is this? Uh, But, uh, Tino, I wanted to get you on this. uh, How, uh, there's a lot of talk about Chinese influence growing because investments have grown. And this sort of trade agreement with Bangladesh is one example. But also we saw what happened a couple of years ago in the Maldives. Uh, we've seen sort of contestation in Sri Lanka. Uh, I don't think, you know, I'm sort of going to keep Pakistan out of all of this. But Nepal recently, more recently, I wanted to first get your sense of, uh, you know, is China's engagement within these countries deepening beyond just the economic aspect of it? Or is it also becoming deeply political? Because uh, you've seen some examples of it in Nepal. And is that something that uh, sort of, uh, when Indian commentators look at it, they obviously worry about it. But I want to first get your thoughts on that in terms of how the engagement, nature of engagement has changed. And then we'll talk about India's sort of weaknesses or strengths within the region, because there's lots of lots of anxiety that you see in the Indian media. Yeah, I think what... Uh uh, you mentioned as anxiety is really a, a good word to a good word to describe the way India has looked at this economic presence uh, in its immediate periphery, and that's what Shivani I think was also mentioning in the example of Bangladesh, that a, a liberalization of trade between Bangladesh and China is seen with some anxiety, concern, even as a threat uh, among certain sectors here in India. I think it's telling of um, in many ways the lack of self-confidence in India and inability to offer economic alternatives uh, to what China is doing in these neighboring countries. And that's a difficult, challenging adaptation process for the Indian strategic you know, mindset and the Indian strategic um, communities. It basically means that you have to somehow reduce your traditional investment in political and security instruments and start delivering more Uh, on the economic front, whether that's a free trade agreement, investments, but basically not, again, this interesting word used of charity. uh, It is really uh, a strategic altruist policy because it creates interdependence between India and its neighboring countries. And the only way to create that interdependence is through infrastructure, connectivity, trade. That is what really will carry the relationship forward. Now, this is not, as we all know, Uh, the privileged instrument in India's neighborhood policy, at least till the 1990s. This is a discourse that begins in the 2000s, accelerates precisely in the last five to 10 years in response to what the Chinese have been doing. 
And that, I think, is actually a welcome development. It's not still the predominant approach, unfortunately. Uh, we still have far too much focus on this language and this reaction of anxiety, of trying to deny uh, those links between your neighboring countries, whether it's the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, even Myanmar, Nepal, Bhutan, or China, um, and far too little, conversely, on the language of connectivity and delivering more to tie these countries to, to India. And that is a reflection, as we again all know, of India's own economic policy at home. Uh, it is only a more open India in terms of investments, in terms of trade, that will be able to bring greater strategic heft uh, in its foreign policy. And we see that again in Sri Lanka. Uh, you saw the Chinese announcing a 500 million uh, assistance package within two weeks of uh, uh, the COVID crisis uh, in March. Uh, you just saw the news in the Maldives of uh, um, China writing off a significant, or at least, sorry, not writing off, but uh, delaying by four years, uh, suspending uh, a significant portion of its debt. Um, to the Maldives. So these are the instruments that will become more and more important in the region. All right. I'm going to sort of, I, you know, what I, what I find interesting about what you said is the fact that India needs to be, uh, is the policy approach within India will ch- needs to change for us to sort of engage differently with our neighbors. Yet it seems like just last, you know, just that this is not really on the horizon because last week there were reports about the Commerce Ministry looking at, uh, you know, trade agreements with regional partners out of worry that the Chinese were sort of exploiting things like, uh, you know, the country of origin norms and things like that to sort of funnel in cheap products into India. Um, again, this anxiety played out with India not being uh, sort of walking out of the RCEP agreement. Um, and now if you're going to be looking at our regional trade agreements also with such a with such suspicion, which I mean, for, by all means, the, the Chinese might be sort of leveraging these agreements, but they also bring trade benefits and linkages between you and your neighboring country. So would you want to sort of, you know, cut down that linkage also start tracking down on that? And what is the strategic implication of doing something like that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's just uh, a natural demand from these countries. If you go to Nepal these days, uh, there's a huge need for uh, foreign investment in the infrastructure sector. Uh, Sri Lanka, as you know, has been modernizing its infrastructure, its rail, ports and road and energy infrastructure over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, Bangladesh uh, was just pre-COVID crisis poised to surpass India in terms of its GDP per capita. So these are economies that are growing, that have their necessities, and they will require foreign investment. They're also unlike what we often think, quite aware of the balance and the trade-off they have to make uh, between China, India, Japan, the U.S. So it's not that they're falling unknowingly into these debt traps from the Chinese, like we like to call them. They're taking difficult choices. They're trying to balance. They're trying to hedge, coming to a term we were just discussing before starting this program. And they're trying to increase their bargaining power uh, by diversifying their partners. Now, that's a difficult game, and history shows us many cases where uh, smaller states have uh, played this balancing game and um, failed often because, uh, you know, in the end, you can um, end up having less strategic aut- autonomy than, than when you began playing this game. Uh, and therefore, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult in this region um, for India also to assume and expect these countries not to diversify their relations. But Manoj, also coming, I, I don't think that the, re- that the change in policy needs to happen. I'd say it has happened already. That's why I like to go back to the 2000s. If you go back to the major initiatives in the early 2000s, both under Prime Minister Vajpayee and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, they were clear about connectivity, the language of interdependence, the language of delivering, uh, whether it's on development cooperation or financing. So I think it's a process that has begun in tandem with India's economic reforms in the 90s, accelerated in the 2000s, failed on the Western Front with Pakistan, shifted since then slightly east towards this whole look east, act east policy and south toward this Indian Ocean region policy. And most importantly, became a priority only after China uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative started making inroads in these neighboring countries. That's um, fascinating, right? I mean, if you think of that, yeah, Shibani, please go ahead. Adding to what Constantino was saying, with Sri Lanka, for instance, it received a loan of $500 million from China immediately, while simultaneously 
the request that Sri Lanka had made to India to postpone its debt repayment was still under consideration for, I think, about four to five months now. And um, we can see that there is a strategy that India has, but with while it's in competition with China in the neighborhood, it seems to be reacting slightly slowly when compared to China. And going back to a point that Constantino also made earlier that the ties need to be institutional and go beyond like the political and, um, you know, photo op and symbolic gestures. But uh, in the immediate memory that the neighborhood has of India, especially say Sri Lanka or the Maldives, it is that India ran interference when the leadership in these countries was not something that India liked. Um, But there is very little talk about what are the institutional ties that India has with either of those countries. So Shibani, I wanted to also get more inputs from you from in terms of, you know, we've spoken about a little bit about what's happened during the pandemic. Um, Tracking the Chinese, what I've seen is that they've been sort of publicizing each of their uh, deliveries of health supplies to each country. Every time one of these supplies happens, you see a photo op with with the Chinese ambassador delivering them. uh, And you see each quantity being mentioned in press releases and things like that. At the same time, you've also seen some concern about Belt and Road uh, projects being stalled uh, and some actually continuing. For example, this, uh, from what I understand, work on the Padma Bridge in Bangladesh is continuing. I wanted to get a sense of what the Chinese, if you followed, have been doing in terms of the pandemic, apart from what we've already mentioned. Uh, what, what does that tell us about their approach? And secondly, even India sort of tried this, right? I mean, in the early days, there was a SARC meeting. There's been attempts at setting up a fund from what I understand. So just wanted to get a sense of what's happened and how this competition has played out during the pandemic. Uh, right. So China has definitely appeared very active in this war against the pandemic, as it's been called. Um the Chinese foreign minister was reported to have said that the BRI has severely slowed down because of the pandemic, but um, he did add that it is only a temporary setback and that things would go back on track. So that's to kind of reassure uh, their partners in the BRI. Um, but one of the things to happen out of all of this is the the relaunch of the Health Silk Road, which is a uh, a component of the BRI and um, it, it was fairly, I think, like lesser known, um, but Beijing has wanted to shape public health governance since um, 2015. And uh, the Health Silk Road is an initiative that gives uh, China that opportunity. I, I don't think there have been any like direct links in terms of these are the initiatives that fall under the Health Silk Road. But, um, I mean, you could argue that the loan extended to Sri Lanka is kind of under that. Xi Jinping had a conversation with the Italian Prime Minister, I think, in sometime in February and March, where um, the cases of COVID were rising in Italy, where he has um, offered assistance under uh, the Health Silk Road. So, um, yeah, this is also an opportunity to uh, keep BRI going and also allows China to ex- enter new markets that it were it wasn't able to enter with the BRI because the net that China seems to cast is, is very wide. It's from like Greece to Ukraine even. So, um, that is what China has been doing. Um, in terms of India, I think initially there was um, some reports of uh, India supplying like uh, paracetamol and other drugs to neighboring uh, states. I personally haven't come across any um, other news items except for activating uh, currency swaps with, I think, Maldives as uh, well as um, Sri Lanka. All right. So basically, we're seeing both sides doing some bits of work in the Chinese sort of engaging in uh, sort of redefining their engagement within the framework of the Silk Road, giving it a new name, new label, uh, a shiny new label, which they can call Silk Road, because everything has to be related to BRI in some way or the other. Um, I wanted to get you both your thoughts on sort of the last couple of questions that I had in mind. Uh, the first is about 
Constantino, you spoke about how, you know, these states in uh, in the Indian subcontinent, whether it's Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, who else, they, you know, these are not sort of just sitting ducks. Uh, these are states which have agency, which sort of make their choices, which are hedging, uh, which are not just sitting and falling into debt traps. And that's, I think, an important point for people to take away that these states have agency. I wanted to look at from an India-China perspective, given that there is, uh, you know, just what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, right, with Nepal, the fact that there is a sense in India that the Chinese have been sort of shooting off Nepal's shoulder in some way. And I sort of, I wanted to first get your thoughts on that in terms of that specific situation with Nepal. But then broadly, is this sort of, a zero-sum game that we are going to see in the future between India and China that's developing? Or are there sort of modes of cooperation that these two sides can go back to? This seems really difficult given particularly what's happening at the border right now between the two countries. But let's assume that that gets settled sooner or later peacefully in one manner, uh, in one way or the other. And do we then see still a zero-sum game going forward? Or do we see some sort of modes of cooperation emerging? Yeah, I think great question, Manoj, because uh, I think the relationship and these these relationships are much more complex than this binary, you know, cooperation or conflict. Um, and uh, to start with, I'd say that, yes, no doubt that nothing should surprise us that uh, as China deepens its economic engagement um, in many countries around the world, including India, by the way, it will translate that into policy and political influence. That's the same for India. That's the same for the U.S. That's the same for every state in international relations. And uh, therefore, we should expect, and I think we've seen many elements and examples of this in recent years, that China will start converting uh, its leverage into political influence. And again, it's not a a moral issue. It is a natural principle issue because China has now principal stakes uh, as an investor in many of these economies. And to protect these principles, it will naturally try to play strategic games in the background, policy, outreach, everything from benign diplomatic outreach up to malign or more sort of Uh, covert instruments to affect the political systems in these countries, play a mediating role like we've seen in Nepal recently, etc. Second, we need to know much more about this. And Manoj, you've been doing, I think, with Shibani and many others at Takshashila, great work in mapping the modes of Chinese investment in South Asia and the modes, modes of Chinese engagement. We know very little. This is a larger problem about China expertise in India and in South Asia. But I think it's being corrected thanks to you and many others who are really looking and tracking uh, Chinese engagements uh, uh, carefully. And that will tell us much more about the minutia of how China operates and the dilemma, the, Chin- the dilemmas the Chinese are also facing as they step up the engagement. And finally, relating to this recent uh, uh, piece of research I did for a China-India um, handbook on uh, China-India relations, where I argued that India and China actually have gone through five modes, and these are all overlapping. There's a mode of cooperation, you know, China and India training Afghan diplomats, for example. There's a mode of coordination that has happened in the past, where India and China actually speak to each other about these third countries and try to align the diplomatic strategies. In the past, even sometimes to cut out the Americans in other countries. A third, a mode of coexistence where they're not actually talking and coordinating, but they're comfortable with each other. In Bangladesh, for example, since the 1980s, 90s, China has been a military supply to Bangladesh and India was always quite comfortable with that or at least didn't deny the Chinese that space. You have a fourth mode, which is one of competition which is not necessarily bad because it brings both countries into a competitive logic of trying to deliver more, better and faster. In fact, I think that has actually activated a lot uh, in India's neighborhood policy, which we should have seen much earlier. But fortunately, now it's happening that India is trying to sort of look at what China is doing and trying to match that or at least doing it differently, but also giving out more in terms of economic assistance, in terms of interdependence and connectivity. And finally, yes, there have been moments and there are, I think, increasingly more moments of conflict as a fifth mode, where both countries are trying to undermine each other in these third countries. And I expect as India-China relations go south in the last few weeks, uh, this will translate into a more conflictual India-China relationship in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, in the Maldives, in the Indian Ocean region, and across Southeast Asia too. I think that's fascinating about what you've just talked about is the fact that 
you know, there's, there's become a common belief uh, given the way, uh, you know, news coverage happens these days that history began in, in China in 2013, 2014 with Xi Jinping and BRI and mm. history began in India at this point of time and everything that's happening is so new. Whereas actually when you look back, there are so many different modes of, like you outlined, cooperation, conflict, co- contestation and all of the re- others that each side has sort of learned to adapt over time and that sort of adaptation can happen even in the future depending on how their interests sort of line up. Um, Shibani, uh, your last thoughts on how uh, India and China, uh, do you see this as a zero-sum game developing or is there scope for both of these sides, sort of both of these countries to coexist in the Indian Ocean region, given that it's, you know, in the Indian Ocean region and with regard to these smaller states in South, uh, South Asia, given that there are strategic interests involved for both of them? I am an optimist. So I, I, I would say that there is, um, despite everything that's happening right now, I see that there will be uh, coexistence with some elements of uh, competition and uh, conflict as well. But mostly uh, I would label, label it as coexistence because also that uh, all the other states in the neighborhood are not going to side with either one of the uh, countries entirely or fully. They are going to use the leverage that they hold against these two big guys and uh, try to get the most from both of them. So it's not going to be a case where China is able to eliminate India entirely from the neighborhood or India sort of is able to, uh, you know, uh, reduce the all the influence that China has in the neighborhood. They're go- both going to be around um, like they have been. And uh, I, I think it's... Uh, the neighborhood has a role to play and to ensure that they both are around. Right. This is, yeah, that's, I think that's, the, that's a good point to sort of end this conversation on that, you know, in all of the talk about the two big uh, players in the region, uh, we often tend to overlook the uh, smaller states and the fact that they've, not just survived, but also thrived in many ways over the decades, despite there being competition between India and China, uh, tells you a little bit about how adaptable and versatile their foreign policy can be. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shibani and Constantino. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Um, and thank you so much, folks, for listening to All Things Policy. Thank you, Manoj. Thanks, Manoj. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money and Intel. Really, really fun week. And I think that you guys should definitely check out some of the stuff we did. So we had Shifa Metra, who is the host of the show Smile India on the Paperback Podcast. Really fun thing. On Edges and Sledges, our hosts uh, had an episode just amongst themselves. No guests this time. Really fun show with lots of cool banter. I think you'll enjoy that quite a bit. On Storytellers and Story Sellers, Vineet had Shristi Bell on. Shristi is the head of Netflix in India, and I think you'll really enjoy that conversation as well. Also, do check out Uncle Please Sit. Joel and Tushar had Anuya Chatakar on. Anuya hosts the popular YouTube channel Books on Toast. And don't forget others of your old favorites like The Habit Coach, Football Should Ball, All Things Policy. All of them are doing a great job during this pandemic, and you should definitely check them out. And with that, we hope to see you again next week. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have.